Good afternoon. It's just midday. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity of sharing with you uh, our experience. And I would also like to thank Amora Civic Exchange for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm actually a, a great a keen walker, so everything that you have been hearing in the last few days and also for the rest of this conference and, and tomorrow is, is absolutely where, where I am. And so, uh, but today, what I'm going to talk about is actually not about walking, well, not directly. Um, I look at the agenda and I decide that actually I'll talk about something that is linked to health and sustainability, and also that matters to probably a lot of you uh, in the audience. Can I just have a show of hands how many people are employees or, or work? Okay, so it's the majority, right? Okay, so um, I'm going to run through some theories um, and also some you know, experience, uh, mainly from the UK because uh, prior to coming to Hong Kong to join AIA, uh, I spent most of my career in Australia and, and actually the majority in the UK, where there has been a lot of developments and progress in uh, workplace health. So the data is there, and what I hope is that at the end uh, of, the, of uh, the talk, then we can discuss how we're going to have the same sort of progress uh, in Asia and, and, and in Hong Kong. Okay, so this is what I'm going to cover. I'm going to look at some global health trends. You're going to come on a journey with me. Uh, what we know about healthy workplaces, evidence linking health, healthy workplaces with employee well-being, and also organizational performance. So what's the bottom line? Some models of workplace well-being and work healthy workplaces. What can employers do? And what can employees do? Um, experience and findings from the Britain's uh, Healthiest Workplace Study. Um, and of course, health and well-being becoming um, you know, national issues of increasing importance uh, around the world. Right, poor lifestyle choices. On the right, you see this 3, 4, 50, right? So three, uh, three causes of, of poor lifestyle uh, behaviors, uh, four causes of, of main, uh, main uh, causes of premature death, uh, and of course, uh, the main causes of uh, death worldwide, 50% are non-communicable disease. Now, when, when I copied this slide, uh, that, was the, that was what was given to me. And then I showed it to a colleague this morning. He said, you mean you're already out of date. It's no longer 3, 4, 50. It is now 4, 4, 60. Right? So this physical activity, nutrition, smoking, and now we have the fourth, which is alcohol overconsumption. And I think that um, certainly with workers, this is becoming a problem. And of course, 60% now of premature death are, are due to um, non-communicable disease. So next year, if, if I get invited back, it'll be 4, 4, 60. Um, there is an uh, under-consumption of wellness. It's so easy now to gain now, pain later, than pain now, gain later. Right, um, but some of us uh, know that it is going to give us better life, uh, healthier, longer lives if we both gain and pain now. And actually, the pain after a while doesn't get painful. It actually becomes a pleasure because when you exercise, you get all the you know. This is this is evidence based, right? The doctors in the room will tell you. You actually get the right hormones, and you feel such a thrill when you're walking and you're exercising. It becomes like brushing your teeth. And if you don't do it, you feel you're missing out on the, you know, all these stimulants that are natural. Um, increasing affordability for healthcare around the world, but actually in Asia, is becoming a real problem, uh, more than in developed countries. Our healthcare costs, because of chronic diseases and so on, are escalating. So we need to do something. And this is just some comparison uh, across some of the countries in Asia. Increasing costs, increasing frequency, more use, and more mortality and more morbidity. So if you look at it, the trend is, over just a three-year period, a significant rise in musculoskeletal aches and pains. Lots of people have those. Um, circulatory, heart, kidney, stroke, high blood pressure, and of course, cancer. An increasing uh, rate of, of incidence in all, com all communities. So this is very worrying. Oh, and of course, all of these are major diseases that would require expensive high-cost treatment, unless you prevent it early on. 
Uh, some of you may be aware of the uh, AIA Healthy Living Index that we do across all of our countries that we operate in. And uh, in Hong Kong, uh, Civic Exchange also did a, a similar sort of uh, health survey uh, earlier this year. And what is common is actually that um, the local population are less uh, satisfied with their health. Actually, the majority, which is a bit sad. Um, why is that? Well, if you ask, for, ask them, and that's what the survey is, what are the main causes of stress? The top one is work pressures. Right? So work pressures, financial worries, managing health, family needs, and so on. And then, of course, major concerns. And that is why workplace is so important. Increasingly for children, we are saying that you use schools to reach out to children and their families. Workplace is where you reach out to workers and their families. So what is a workplace? Actually, at the start, um, Danny was asking me, so what's your definition of workplace? If I work at home, is that a workplace? Well, WHO has a definition of what is a healthy workplace. Um, you can find it on WHO uh, website. They've got a lot of fantastic materials there. But actually, anywhere that you work is a workplace. Um, and the best, in a way, the best judge of what a workplace is, if you ask the health and safety uh, executive, which, uh, or you ask the tax department, tax office, they will tell you because you can claim. Um, yeah. So where you work, anywhere, is a workplace. And there are three factors that actually influence that. It's the individual, your own risk factors, and of course, the work that you do, and the environment. So those are the three factors. So just give a picture that often we think of workplaces, uh, certainly from like, you know, uh, a lot of corporates, we think of the picture uh, on the bottom left, offices, or we think of factories, we think of lots of people. But actually, a lot of work, us work in many different places. And I think that majority of the people in the room will probably identify with the bottom right. At night, still doing emails, doing the report. That's all workplaces. <laughs> um, and the WHO has a healthy workplace model. Um, again, it looked at the risk um, and how we can promote healthy behaviors. This model is on their website, and it comes in all of the United Nations languages. So um, uh, you know, if you ever want to download it, it's, it's very useful. Now I'm going to take you through, after WHO, a few other models um, of uh, healthy workplaces and well-being. So the first one, I said I'll be using a lot of UK uh, examples, is from the UK's Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. This is the professional college for all the uh, specialist HR uh, people in the UK and around the world. Um, so they conducted research and found that these are the fundamentals. If you want to have a healthy workplace, then you actually need to have the right senior leadership that champions it, the right culture, the right process, HR processes and systems and people management. Uh, that would then create the environment for employee well-being. And then when people are happy at work, they will then engage and engagement leads to productivity and performance. So this is based on research conducted by CIPD. And they, from that, they develop a well-being model looking at how the individual interact with the organization to come up with five dimensions. Uh, that is both, and, and I, I don't need to repeat that, but you can see that actually it's not just all about work. It's we come to work with our health and our stress and our family and, and everything else that we take with us. So we actually need to look at how our aspirations, ambitions, values, systems, uh, and how we interact with people. I mean, earlier on, uh, Charin talked about socializing and so on. It's all very important because at the end of the day, when we at the end of the day when we go home, we want to feel that it has been a day, a good job, well done, satisfied, and all that contribute to personal growth and satisfaction. Another one, this is actually a very good uh, study. So you can find all of the studies that I refer to. Uh, many of them are systematic reviews, so a review of reviews. And, and this one was commissioned uh, by the UK government, the Department of uh, Work and Pensions, and they commissioned PwC to, to carry out a systematic review. Um, it is, it's, I, you can download you know, all available on the web. Um, basically, what is the business case for healthy workplaces and wellness programs at work? That effectively is a question that they want to answer. And if it works, 
how will we implement it? So it's uh, very interesting. They look at um, all of 55 UK case studies, looking at literature review and so on, and then it identifies some key messages that we'll look through in the next four or five slides. Um, so they came up from their review, this model, which I think is actually a very good model. I like this because this is simple, right? We often think about healthy workplaces as, um, in the old days, health and safety, right? That's where it started, health and safety, so that you don't have accidents at work, prevention, don't fall over. And, and especially because it comes from an era of manufacturing, of construction, of, of, of the sort of industrial revolution. So workplace safety was the problem. But now we're moving into knowledge economy and people work at home and, and, and share you know, workplaces, etc. That is still important, but we now have new considerations. And so ill health and promoting good health is really important, right? So we have health and safety, but we also have health promotion and disease prevention. And the bottom is about prevention um, and work-life balance, all the things that you can do about lifestyle risk factors to prevent something from happening, prevent you from getting the disease. But we also know we have to be realistic that probably up to a third of people who come to work already have some, some you know, um, illness or, for example, like high blood pressure, very, very prevalent in the population or other you know, um, stress. Um, so several issues that we need to tackle. And it's not just about having a fitness or having yoga at work. Um, it's actually you need to tackle it in the round. And I found that this is a, a, a good model. Um, the study looked at how, how you can attribute benefits. Remember, this is a, a business case. Can you make an economic case for investing in wellness at work. So they look at this and they identify benefits that can be attributed to wellness from those studies. Um, big impact is sickness absence, uh, of course, but these are the ones that you count. There are, of course, there is now another concept called presenteeism, which is that people who are not that well, but actually struggle into work. And they are the ones that you know, sometimes cough and, and just feel lousy or have heartburn. And, and they try to do a good job, but actually they, they're just not as good as they could be at work, not at the, right at the top. So, um, and that's not even counted in the sickness absence. Um, staff turnover, another issue, accident injury, satisfaction, and so on. So these are all evidence-based uh, of what are the benefits if you put in uh, such a, a wellness programs. Further, you look at return on investment, how much you have to invest or spend in order to get your money back. So they look at different industries, and you can see that actually, uh, in some industries, it is call center physiotherapy, 34. So for every $1 you invest, you get 34 back. Um, flu, fantastic. For every $1, $9 back, worth. So there are some really good value initiatives that we should be putting in, into practice straight away. How can we measure some of this uh, performance, um, return on investment? So there are already some uh, performance indicators that HR uh, people, departments measure, like sickness absence, employee satisfaction, staff turnover, um, accidents and in injuries, and so on. But actually, you can also measure those bottom line uh, company benefits, like overtime and so on. So again, these are all in the report, and I, I don't want to go through them. Maybe we can discuss later on. But they make really strong case, uh, well evidence for why we need to invest in wellness programs. So. Despite all that, so how can actually well-being affect workplace performance? So why is it that some people perform so well at work? You know, do they come in with a bounce and they do their work and they're happy and they go home, next day they come in again. And I know sometimes you, you, you feel that, well, what, what is it, what, what, what they're on? Um, yeah. And so this is another uh, literature review that was done by Bryson. Um, I've given you the reference there. Um, you can see the UK government have taken this very seriously in the last 10 years. So a lot of government investment, um, investing in even research into this area. Um, so they, they are looking to why some people perform better at their job. Is it just because they're well or, or, or what? Right? So what they find is that actually when you're happy, when you, are, you, you feel that you are fit, 
you think more creatively, and then you are more effective at problem solving. So that's one. And second, it affects employees' attitude to work. I think that is true, right? If you think that your employer cares about you, you have all of this supportive uh, framework, and you're also feeling that you are, you are in good health and, and happy and healthy, your whole attitude towards work will change. And that will enable you to be you know, so much more positive and open, and, and, and so that's the second factor. And then the third is the physical health itself. If you take good care of yourself, uh, we talk about walking, very important, uh, eating well, sleeping, uh, we'll talk, come to talk about sleeping because Hong Kongers don't sleep enough, uh, by improving employees, your physical cardiovascular health, it actually improves your immunity, so you are less likely to be sick in the first place, and if you do get sick, you are going to recover quicker, uh, and of course, get more energy uh, and, and better effort. So these are all evidence again. Um, finally, I want to talk about the Britain's healthiest workplace. So this is a study, uh, an annual study that started in 2013 uh, by um, Vitality in the UK in collaboration with RAND, which is a non-for-profit uh, research study and Cambridge University. So what they did is uh, they put a call out in 2013 to the country. You don't need to be a, a, a customer. You just, they, they advertise saying that we're going to conduct this study about workplace wellness. Right. So if you want to participate, it doesn't cost a, a business anything or organizations anything. You sign up and then if the company sign up, then the employees will get access. They will be emailed a questionnaire to complete, and the employer also complete the questionnaire. So you have the bottom-up view and the top-down view, and then we check for consistency. So they ask a lot about how employees feel about their own health, and also how employers feel they are taking action to, to improve the health of their uh, staff. Um, and they, so this is now the third year that they have reported it, and, and it's been uh, very popular, as you can see, that um, since then, over 400 companies and over 100,000 uh, uh, staff have taken part in the study. This is something that actually provides a lot of data. Um, and earlier on, we talked about, you know, if you have data, then we can work with it, and we can certainly for researchers, it will be interesting, but I think for insurance or, or government or any, anybody, any stakeholder, when we have data, we can project and we can work together. Uh, how, how can we work, you know, uh, create, promote, uh, implement uh, healthy workplaces? So what did they find? Um, so what they found last year... Uh, these are the topical health issues in the UK, but actually I could put that in any country in Asia. It applies in Hong Kong, it applies in China, anywhere. Because actually what we're seeing is, okay, disabled people, how when you have been long-term sick, not just uh, permanently disabled, but sometimes return to work, how, how do we do that? And also increasingly, especially in Asia, small and medium-sized enterprise and micro-organizations. Uh, and increasingly, we have the, the startups and the, the net uh, companies. How do we do that? How do we make sure people have that, that, that social support, but which also contributes to, to good health? Insecure work. In the UK, we have zero uh, hours contract, but it's actually just casual work. So you never know when you're going to be called. They will just call you and say, can you come in for two hours? You know, that sort of uncertainty um, and doesn't help put people on a lot of stress, which contributes to financial insecurity. And shift work, we know. Doesn't, uh, it has negative effects on health. When you're on night shift, it again affects your hormones and so on. And young people today, especially, not only you know, we have the problems of unemployment, but also they find that they are increasingly stressed, their lifestyle, and decreasing resilience. So trends from the healthiest uh, workplace study for this re recent, uh, that just was released last month, is that they found that depression, stress, depression, are linked to low income and to the younger generation. Actually, the two are linked, isn't it? Young, younger generation generally because they have to start um, and they have low income. Uh, lack of sleep for high earners. So uh, the picture earlier on, those who are burning midnight oil doing emails or, or, or bring your, your iPhone with you to bed. And yeah, lack of sleep is, is a big thing because it actually linked to lower productivity in the long term. Um, and also, of course, you're more likely to get fat. Um, not, not so good. Um, inadequate physical activity, obesity, high blood pressure, um, linked to a lot of days, working days lost, and that's 11% of days, and that's, the, um, that's uh, worked out that uh, due to suboptimal health, and uh, drivers of long, uh, lost days, well, you know, that's what we've been talking about. 
lack of sleep, financial concerns, stress, depression, poor physical health. So these are feedback from all the surveys that were completed by staff uh, and companies. So th this is big numbers. So what can we do to improve workplace health? Um, insights from uh, the Britain's health, uh, healthiest workplace, all the things that we can all do together. Employers certainly have a role, um, but I think that it's really, I think the theme is when you want to tackle health, it is about partnership. Conclusions? So what, does it, what are the take-home messages? There are a lot of drivers for us to make sure that workplaces are healthy and safe and promote employee well-being. People work best when they can achieve and they are high-performing and then, of course, when they are healthy, well and engaged. Healthy workplaces make business sense and we have demonstrated through some of the evidence that workplaces wellness programs generate savings and we have provided some models where uh, companies can apply. But I think importantly is that we need to measure. Measure and reporting on well-being so that we can then track progress over time and then that will take us to demonstrate that healthy workplace leads to employee well-being and organisational success, which ultimately links back to healthier communities. Thank you.